Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Commodity TV, the new edition of our virtual online interview series. We want to get an update today from Sibanye Stillwater. You remember the fantastic miner out of South Africa and also working in the US, in Finland, in France, almost everywhere in the world. And we have James Wellstead here, the head of investor relations, um, to give us an update. Good morning to South Africa. How are you, James? Morning, Jochen, and mor morning to your listeners. Uh, all, all good. Thank you on the side. Super, perfect. Thank you very much um, for taking the time. I know you are super busy, especially we were just talking about the challenging environment. Um, you just brought out uh, last week your half-year statement, and it looks like the market was a little bit, yeah, let's call it disappointed. I think it's a great opportunity to buy more stock because uh, this is just a momentum, and uh, it looks to me a little bit like that you have now figured in, hopefully, all the hiccups you faced in the last six to nine months as so what's your opinion on that? Yeah, listen, it's, it has been quite a challenging environment this year so far. I mean, we started the year a little bit more positive on the, the outlook for PGMs particularly, which, as you know, our biggest uh, earning segment. Um, but there's been quite a significant deterioration in PGM prices this year. Rhodium down over 67%. Palladium down over 30%. So it's had quite a big impact on margins for the industry. And you would have noted that that almost all the PGM stocks have, have dropped significantly. Um, and I think with, with our uh, exposure to the PGM industry still, uh, we obviously are developing our battery metals uh, for future exposure to battery metals, which we think is going to be very positive over the long run. Um, but certainly in the short run, you know, we are investing in that space. And at the same time, our margins have been under pressure. And hence, you know, the market response was very similar to what we saw with our peers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so why, why do you think uh, especially rhodium was uh, cut down that heftily and uh, why also the, uh, the, the platinum palladium prices? Is it due to yeah, lower car sales? Uh, is it due to more, let's say, uh, um, plug-in cars? What, what, what's the reason for that? I think it's a combination of things. I mean, platinum was only down about 15%. Um, mm. So it's held up relatively better. But then again, platinum is only 40% of demand comes from the auto sector, from, from auto catalysts. Whereas for rhodium and um, palladium, it's about 90 and 80% respectively. Um, and I think going into the year, there was a bit of expectations for a, a rebound in the in the uh, auto sales globally, mm. um, driven by the fact that, you know, we'd already been through uh, a large part of the interest rate hiking cycle in the US. We'd been through the European winter when there were concerns about the impact of higher gas prices and gas supply from Russia, obviously, and what that would mean for, for European growth. And then with China coming out of uh, the China, uh, COVID zero policy. But, you know, I think the Chinese recovery has been a bit slower than people anticipated, uh, impacted obviously by the um, real estate market, which has been quite tricky this year. And then the US have continued to to increase their rates or, or keep their rates higher um, with inflation obviously staying a, a little bit sticky and, and staying relatively high. So all of that has had a bit of a dampening effect on um, the economic outlook. Uh, people uh, are less positive. But I think the biggest impact, which wasn't really forecast by the market or expected, has been significant destocking or you know inventories that had built up in the, the value chain um, uh, over COVID and, and thereafter when we had supply issues and obviously concerns about disruption of uh, Russian supply, a lot of the um, manufacturers, the fabricators, and also some of the industrial uh, players were, were, were obviously um, building up inventories of rhodium and palladium. And now with the outlook seeming a bit more benign and the need to retain those inventories, uh, quite expensive on their balance sheets. Mm -hmm. They've been destocking. Um, and then that's also obviously been compounded by in China, we have seen quite aggressive 
um, BEV penetration into the auto sector there. And uh, there were expectations of some of those subsidies lifting, uh, as well as new emission standards being um, implemented in China in the middle of the year. But that's been pushed out to the end of the year. And really what that's be the reason is that there are a whole lot of vehicles that are on the, the floor still, which would not comply with the new emission standards. So they've decided to delay it to allow those sales to come through and get that inventory off the floor. So all of that's um, uh, really reduced demand for PGMs in the first half of this year. Okay, but it sounds to me a little bit like uh, this is only a matter of time, uh, because once uh, the the destocking is done, then then you have to do something in addition again, and so I think twenty twenty four might be yeah a little bit better, right? Yeah, listen, I mean, it does depend on the econ global economic outlook to some extent, but mm -hmm. certainly we do think that with the de when the destocking lifts, um, you know, that will reduce some of the pressure on the prices. And then what we're also seeing on the supply side is that supply is also under quite a lot of pressure with prices where they are. So first of all, I mean, we, we've certainly seen that our recycling operations um, the recycling business has not picked up as some of the market uh, uh, was expecting. Um, you know, we're still seeing uh, uh, issues in the collector pipeline, um, not able to finance inventories and also less people actually, um, uh, I guess, uh, uh, scrapping their cars and selling their cars and buying new cars. So that's impacted on, on recycling. And then in South Africa, we've had the impact of, of load curtailment, which has impacted a bit on, on supply. And then also lower prices at the moment could result in supply response from the producers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then let's talk a bit uh, more positive here on the future. First of all, what I saw in your financials for the half year, um, and which is really impressive because you have net debt of only 14 million US dollars. For a company of your size, this, this is absolutely outstanding. So you have a lot of financial power. Um, you uh, have earned money and you are paying also dividend. Thanks for that. I'm a shareholder of your company and look forward to receive that. I think this month we get the money. Um, so that is, that is very positive. You are in extremely good shape uh, to my understanding. Um, and also I saw uh, the equity capital is fully funded for the Caliber project and uh, you are here also on track, right, to uh, start the battery grade lithium hydroxide production from 2025, which is like only one and a half years ago, uh, away. That's that's correct. So first of all, I mean, we have obviously been quite conservative with our capital allocation. We've got a very uh, clear capital allocation framework, which we follow. And as you said, I mean, we ended uh, and, and you know, the 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 six months end of June um, with 22 uh, billion rand of cash on our balance sheet. And then we've also got significant undrawn debt facilities. So we we virtually debt neutral at the moment on a net on a net net basis. Um, and we recently refinanced our dollar revolving credit facility uh, and increased the size to a billion dollars. So we've got significant undrawn facilities and quite a lot of balance sheet uh, firepower and flexibility, which I think puts us in a, a good position if, if we do go into a slower economic environment, obviously to endure through that, but also gives us the ability to pursue opportunities if they come up and you know as you know i mean it's when when times are tough that the value opportunities come up um and then we are continuing to deliver we see uh future um uh you know deficits in many of the battery metals in, in mm -hmm. lithium particularly so we are continuing to progress those projects and uh the caliber project in finland is going very well so far we are busy with the refinery and that's progressing extremely well so as you say we'll be on track for production in about 2025 2026 Mm -hmm. Okay, super. Um, I mean, that's uh, one of your key projects for the future metals, I will call it. Um, that's in Finland. The other one is uh, Sondeville, the nickel refinery in France. I think this is also something really with a lot of uh, future potential because on the one hand, nickel is uh, really needed and we need uh, also the... the um, um, capacities here in Europe for the for the refining, uh, but how is it going there, for example, uh, with uh, the battery recycling? Because I think that might be something in the future also, uh, which could be super important for you. 
Yeah, so Sunderville, I mean, we did buy that facility more for that uh, entry into the French ecosystem, battery ecosystem. Um, and we are continuing with studies uh, looking at nickel sulfate, which is a battery metal um, uh, uh, facility, and also PGM and battery metal recycling studies as well that we expect to be complete, you know, towards the end of this year. Um, the actual facility which we acquired from Eremet, uh, you know, the intention was obviously that was never the future of, of that business, but certainly to get that back to uh, break even. Uh, but with nickel prices falling the way they have, and then with higher input prices like gas prices, etc., as well as quite significant disruptions that we experienced in the first half of the year. Strikes in France, as you know, there have been nationwide mm -hmm. strikes, etc. We lost quite a few production days. So we are expecting a better performance in the second half, but we're also given uh, mindful of the fact that the, the environment and the price environment is less supportive at the moment. We are looking at optimizing that facility. And if we can't, we'll obviously have to make a decision on the way forward. But really, we, you know, that uh, that ability or the, the the facility availability for development of the other uh, recycling and battery metal is still available to us, of course. Mm -hmm, super. Maybe you can say also one word to New Century, your Australian um, uh, arm, <laughs> I would call it. <laughs> So, so that uh, we acquired earlier this year um, mm. uh, on a, an offer to shareholders, um, and we're busy with the integration there. Uh, there is quite an interesting opportunity that comes with um, New Century or Century Mining, um, and that will be the Mount Lyle Copper that they've got an option to acquire from Vedanta. So we are looking at that, looking at the feasibility there, and uh in November, we'll probably make a decision on whether we will exercise that option and then on the way forward there. So again, you know, aligning with our uh, focus on getting into battery metals and obviously copper is a, a, an area that we're interested in. Mm -hmm. Okay, super. Um, so uh, just I forgot one thing to ask you because uh, as you are in that strong financial position, just I'm swapping is uh, shortly back. Uh, do you have like an um, M&A shopping list already? So, uh, yes, I mean, we're always obviously looking around um, for opportunities, but we are very, very uh, value driven and, mm -hmm. um, and and aware of, of you know, the, the, the circumstances that we're in. So we do make those decisions uh, uh, quite conservatively and with a value bias. Um, what we are looking at at the moment, and I think has been quite public, has, is our interest in uh, participating in the Mopani um, process, mm -hmm. which is a copper mine in Zambia. So it's got a, a, a mine that's in operation at the moment, previously owned by Glencore, but then there were some issues with the government of the day and Glencore, Glencore and the government bought back the asset from Glencore. So we are part of that process. Um, there are other competing um, uh, companies as well, but uh, we certainly think it would be a great opportunity. Very high-grade copper um, and potential to expand production or increase production. So we, we are quite interested in that space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, f fully understood. And I think it would be a positive um, um, addition for you. Um, have, uh, let's talk shortly about the South, the South Africa gold operations. Uh, I think it, you had a great turnaround. That looks all good. Uh, you have uh, also done a five-year um, agreement uh, with uh, with your uh, yeah, with, with, with your work associations, um, and so you are also protected here for inflation reasons and stuff like this. It's very good for calculation. So how is it going there? Um, gold price. Yeah, is still quite high, which is good. And uh, do you see, yeah, any challenges, or what? What's your view for the next uh, half year there? So the gold operations, um, we did see a massive turnaround from the uh, strike that we had last year. So they were actually profitable this year um, after, uh, you know, suffering significant losses last year. And that that was the benefit, I guess, of our diverse, diversified portfolio. That did offset quite a lot of the um, pressure on the uh, PGM margins, uh, the fact that, they, that the gold operations were able to contribute. Um, we have ha suffered a setback during the recently at the end of uh, July, though, where we had an incident at the one shaft, our Clear Four shaft, where a counterweight to the uh, conveyance that we use to hoist people up the shaft struck something in the shaft barrel, and then uh, we lost a lot of the ballast weights 
into the shaft infrastructure. So that has caused quite a bit of damage to that shaft, which has prevented us being able to get into that shaft. And it does look like it'll prevent any production from that shaft till the end of the year. So we're currently busy assessing the full impact of some of these uh, um, issues on the operations. Uh, we highlighted at our results also at our PGM operations, there are some um, older shafts that are quite high cost um, that we may need to consider, um, you know, our options in terms of future uh, sustainability of the business. Um, mm. But um, yeah, that's that's where we are at the moment in terms of the wage negotiations. Uh, we got the five-year agreement at our PGM operations, and we are engaging with the unions at Gold to try and extend the existing uh, mm. three-year agreement further but uh you know we that's an ongoing discussion mm -hmm. okay super um last question because uranium prices are really going into the right direction <laughs> we are at 62 62 dollars already and i think you have some 60 80 million uh, pounds as a reserve i would call it in tailings mm. so what's what's the status there are you evaluating that uh, now a little bit closer for maybe a production because i could imagine that would be a great margin in the future yeah, we, we are looking at it, um, you know, together with partners as well. Uh, you know, it may not be something we do ourselves, but certainly in partnership. But we are looking at those options. We've got that surface reserve that you're talking about, which is at our cook operations, where mm. it's on surface so easily accessible. And then the uh, Beatrix 4 shaft that we recently um, closed for gold operations uh, through a Section 189 process earlier this year that was originally a uranium mine in the 1970s and 80s so we are looking at the feasibility of of mining uranium again from that shaft which obviously has already been uh, in place already mm -hmm. wow okay also a half feasibility of mining uranium that's something new <laughs> to me okay i like that <laughs> that's super so you would have like a like a tailings facility and a new mining facility if yeah we're obviously right looking at the, the potential for that it depends on the costs that we can do it at etc mm -hmm. so but as you say with the price moving up it certainly becomes uh all, all the more viable all the time yeah would make really sense to me super james that sounds uh, like uh, yeah the first uh, is is gone that is uh, fantastic but you still made money that is super important also you have no no net debt really i mean 14 million sorry that's like nothing to me and uh, you guys are in really really good shape and uh, thanks again for the dividend look forward to receive it into my account <laughs> wish you all the best thanks for your time today Thank you. Thanks, Jochen. Thank you. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, that was James Wells, the head of investor relations for Sibanje Stillwater. And you heard it. The company faced some hiccups. I mean, challenging markets is one thing. Also, dropping rhodium, palladium prices, platinum prices. That is all not easy. And uh, also, they last year, you remember, they faced a lot of uh, heavy weather um, challenges uh, in Montana. And uh, also, yeah, things are sometimes not easy with mining, but the company, I think, dealt extremely well with that. And uh, to be honest, I think the share price is way too cheap. I will buy again because uh, I still have a much, much higher target for the company, at least five dollars uh, for the normal stock. And uh, so to say for the ADR, it's $20. Um, but uh, yeah, you, you have to really have to do a good uh, look uh, at Sibani Stillwater because as said, it is a fantastic company with tons of future potential. And you heard it, they are also evaluating now mining again uranium. And don't forget the tailings facilities host approximately 60 to 80 million pounds on the surface. So that would be the billion dollar chance here, in addition to the yeah, great business they are doing. And while we are waiting, we, we, uh, we are receiving every six months as a dividend, which does not really hurt. And so from that perspective, great company, check it out. Thanks for watching us and bye-bye from Switzerland.